It's funny, whenever you start a discussion about advances in technology and you're, and I, at my age, you sound like the old fuddy-duddy. Or you sound like the one that wants to go back to the good old days when we didn't have all of this internet. And, and, and I remember when I wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal that was critical of the metaverse and the trivializing of the poor and, and, and of this escapism that virtual reality can become when you're immersed in it. I got a lot of uh, comments, uh, you know, hundreds of comments of people, you know, characterizing me as the old fuddy-duddy, you know, as the, and, and I recognize there's probably some truth to that, you know, the, a nostalgia for times that were simpler, less complicated, and it's a foreign concept to my kids. My five kids are loving all that technology brings, and so there's a generational divide. But for our generation, uh, it seems there can be a sense of uh, discouragement that we feel like uh, things are just going to hell in a handbasket. Mm -hmm. And uh, what gives you hope in the midst mm -hmm. of all of these technological changes and talking about deep fake photos and predator drones and, and technology that will become super intelligent and become self-aware and then no longer want human control? What gives you hope in the face of all these worrisome, fearsome challenges? I feel like concerned, okay, where am I just getting old? And this, I have to unstick the part of me that's getting old and wishes it was like it was from the part that's saying, oh, whoa, we're going into really choppy water here and our wisdom's about to die off. So that, that, that is uh, always we have to figure out what's, what's which. Um, what gives me hope is teaching people how to pray. Same thing it, that ever gave anyone. So connection with God. Connection with God and with themselves because we had recently in a boys high school, uh, 50 young men, 16, 17, they, they can be like young cults. They come into the room and the walls are being slammed into. I mean, it's, it's all motion and movement. It's a storm. I have two sons, I, I, I learned it. And we, we counted them down after a few weeks, we were training them, and they were in 30 minutes of deep, silent, contemplative prayer. There were 55 of us in the room. We were like Buddhist monks, all of us, and, or Catholic mystics. You know, deep reflection and contemplation. And when they came out, they were altered. They were happy, they were calm, they were peaceful, they looked around at everyone else, smiles, and they didn't leave like cults. Mm -hmm. They left in a more orderly fashion. And I can tell you, what I loved about it the most was their faces were so sweet. Mm -hmm. You know, these boys are so beautiful. You know what else gives me hope, Jim? When you teach young people contemplative prayer, they take to it like ducks to water. It just, it, they go like this. Older people have a little more trouble. The younger people are more open to everything, and including this. So I get very excited when I look at how people take to that alternative experience. So this rediscovery of God and their need for time alone, for reflection, to listen, to speak, to, to simply be present to God, what do you what what do you find uh, as the most effective way for someone who's uh, got two kids, busy life, mm -hmm. challenging demands, mm -hmm. and uh, and can't quite find that even thirty minutes to sit uh, set aside for a quiet prayer? Mm -hmm. I think that uh, silence is more than the than the absence of noise. Silence is choosing where to direct your attention. Now, what I often do when it's too much for me, and it doesn't take much you know, where I think I want like silence. I close my eyes, I go to an internal spiritual resting space, and I'm happy there, I'm calm, and I, I feel good It can there. be in a waiting room. Oh, it can, it can be, be in a car. Uh, waiting as, in line. Anywhere. Not driving. No, it's bad for that. You know, it's, it's really bad for that. Don't right. try this at yeah. home. And Don't home. close your eyes driving, although we're going to have <laughs> autonomous vehicles that will allow you. They'll do it for Maybe us. There's the upside. <laughs> there's the upside to the autonomous vehicles. I find it hard to believe. Maybe I'm a control freak, but getting in with an autonomous vehicle doing yeah. the driving, how do you feel about that, Jen? Well, it's, I feel the same way I feel about these surgical uh, robots that they have now. Mm -hmm. uh, this, the developments in robotics no, and informatics, I know, I mean, because, you know, they, don't, they won't really feel sorrow if they mess up, mm -hmm. uh, and so, and they don't have empathy. And, you know, this is, of course, going back to our discussion about the perils of artificial intelligence. It seems like once you define 
what the perils are, this mm -hmm. lack of empathy, lack of wisdom, intuition, mm -hmm. proportionality, ability to distinguish the way human beings can take in stimuli in a bunch of different directions, both emotional, you know, ascension mm -hmm. beings that we are. Um, it seems like that's the key out of this, is that there's a call to people uh, to cultivate uh, this awareness of the strength and power of compassion and empathy and creativity to find time to be fully human again, mm -hmm. to, to catch themselves, to bring balance to their lives so that they're not slaves to their technology because you do see uh, this fight to be master or to be mastered. Well, this goes back to the beginning of time, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, this is it. When people say, I am divine and I'm this, I'm thinking, there's that critical flaw from the very beginning. You're not God. You were created by God. There's always going to be a separation. God's the creator. We're the created. But like, let me ask you a question. When you look at, let's say, the robotic arm that we were having so much fun about. Uh, so I don't have to go take care of my aging mom. I can buy, or however it's going to happen, a robotic arm. So we were calling it the arm. And it will give medication. We can drive it from somewhere else. Let me ask you this, Jim. What would Mother Teresa have said about that? Yeah. What would she have thought about that? She would have found it preposterous. Preposterous. Yeah. The idea, first of all, I think what gets lost is the enrichment that occurs when you reach out with compassion. It changes you. It changes your life. For her and her sisters that were with the lepers and with the AIDS patients and working with the desperately poor all over the world, they, they became so fully human. In, in ways that we can't imagine, and, and you don't become that way till you sacrifice, till you give, as you pointed out. So much of this is a diminishment of the role of suffering and the Christian meaning of human suffering, mm -hmm. the Judaic meaning of mm -hmm. always understood of the, the value of sacrifice for others. Mm -hmm. um, this idea of a life lived for others that mm -hmm. Mother Teresa talked about. Mm -hmm. The metaverse seems to be focused on a life lived for yourself in your own entertainment, your own immersion into a world of your own creation. Mm -hmm. So it is, in a way, kind of the echo of the primordial, I will not serve, right. that, that, I, uh, that I'm the center of and Yeah, existence. and the universe. And to be clear, they're actually not creating anything. They're just pressing buttons from prearranged groups of... And programs, right? Yeah, they're not creating. It's an illusion. And that, that relationships in the matter, they're rather an illusion. Uh, the games they're playing, it's an illusion that they're driving the thing. They're not driving anything. It's pitiful. Go out and drive a car or, you know, <laughs> learn something. Yeah. But I often thought, yeah, mother would have had some things to say about that. Right. Boy, she would have been, it would be the antithesis of who she was and what she did.